Embarrassment is something that we all try to avoid. And while embarrassing moments are no fun for anyone, some of us are actually controlled by our fears of being embarrassed. For example, some people, they actually refuse to eat in public places simply because they're afraid of what others might think about their eating habits. Or maybe it's because they just don't want to risk that embarrassing chive stuck in the teeth problem. Others dread the thought of public speaking simply because they're afraid of the embarrassment that comes along with making a mistake while they speak in public. As a matter of fact, some surveys have even revealed that more people are afraid of public speaking than they are afraid of death itself. This really goes to show that it's just that more people are afraid of being embarrassed in front of others than they are of dying. Then there are those who allow their embarrassment to keep them from enjoying activities and recreations, like going swimming at the beach. Many people just refuse to go swimming at the beach because they're embarrassed, or they'll you know, refrain from going to a high school reunion because they're just embarrassed. So this fear of being embarrassed, it, it can actually become a social prison for many people. With this in mind, I can't help but to think about all of the Christians who struggle with this issue. I can't help but to consider all of the Christians who are too embarrassed to pray out loud in a prayer group meeting. The thought of even sharing their faith with an unbeliever, it's way too embarrassing to even consider the possibility of not knowing an answer, the possibility of making a mistake. They're just too afraid to even consider that kind of embarrassment. Based on this embarrassment, I believe that there are way too many believers who are unwilling to accomplish the great commission by telling others about their faith in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to consider how every believer can overcome their embarrassment. And listen, if you're a believer here this morning who's easily embarrassed about spiritual things, you're easily embarrassed to talk about spiritual things with the people around you, then you can probably relate to the first king of Israel because Saul he seemed to be a man who was also easily embarrassed by his experience with the Holy Spirit. Here in our text today, we're going to see how this first king named Saul, he struggled with the embarrassment of peer groups. Not only that, but I believe that Saul also struggled with the embarrassment of family members. And finally today, we'll see how Saul struggled with the embarrassment of complete strangers. And with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 10, and I want to consider how the first king of Israel was struggling with his own embarrassments. As you're opening your Bible to 1 Samuel 10, I want to set the stage for our text today. I want to remind you that the events that led up to Saul's struggle with embarrassment, it all started when Samuel's sons had failed to become the judges that their father was hoping that they would become. And knowing that Samuel was growing old and that the day of his death was quickly arriving, the elders of Israel approached him and they asked him to raise up a king for them who could rule over the nation of Israel just like the kings of the pagan nations. And that's when the Lord chose Saul to become Israel's first king. Meanwhile, Saul was just sent out by his father to locate their lost livestock. And as they were out searching for this livestock, that's when the prophet Samuel met him and told him all about the, the will of the Lord. Samuel anointed Saul's head with oil, and he sent Saul ahead of him with specific instructions to go to Gilgal and wait for seven days, which that brings us to our text today. And so with this in mind, let's pick up our story here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, where we find Samuel traveling to Gilgal at his fa with his father's servants. Look with me there at verse 10. There were told that when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servants, where did you go? So he said, to look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. 
Saul's uncle said, tell me, please, what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your uh, adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, No, set us a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and your clans. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul the son of Kish was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipments. So they ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty, wrote it in a book, and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Well, here in our text today, we find Saul struggling with the embarrassment that came along with explaining the Lord's calling to others. And I'm guessing that Saul hadn't really grown up a religious fellow. Chances are he just kind of spent his time on his father's farm tending, you know, the livestock and whatnot. Uh, Sure, he probably went to the synagogue every Sabbath. I'm sure he was just a, a good Jewish boy who went to synagogue, but then Monday through or Sunday through uh, through Friday, it was just business as usual. It's obvious to me that his relationship with God was little more than his synagogue visits. I'll remind you that it was even his servant's idea. It wasn't Saul's idea. It was his servant's idea to go and seek help from the prophet Samuel. And as they did at that meeting, Saul's life was turned right side up. Remember, it was after his visit with Samuel that Saul was given a new heart. And that's when the Holy Spirit came upon him. As a matter of fact, look back at verse 6, because there Samuel told Saul that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him, and as a result, he would prophesy and be turned into another man. And just as Samuel promised, the Holy Spirit did come upon Saul, and the Holy Spirit did change his life. Then by the power of the Holy Spirit, Saul spoke prophetic words just like Samuel had promised. Look again there at verse 10, because there we find Saul and his father's servant arriving, at the hill where there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. From this we can be certain that Saul's life changed at that very moment. And as we consider the changed life of Saul, we should also understand that this change, well, it probably caused a bit of embarrassment as he began to prophesy in front of his peer group. With this this in mind, look with me there at verse 11. Because there we learn that it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets. That the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Here in this verse we find that this group of people who knew Saul before this spiritual experience that he had with Samuel. And as they watched him prophesying, his friends were standing there wondering, Hey, what's up with Saul? He's gotten all religious on us. His peers were asking, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? They knew his father. They knew where he was from. They were former friends, and they're wondering if their friend Saul was now among the prophets. And his peer group began to question why their friend was now hanging out with the prophets. Why why isn't Saul hanging out with us? Why is he over there with those religious folks? That's when one of them posed a question that seems to have been been a little bit of a put down there. Look there at verse 12, because there we find one man answering and saying, but who is their father? Now, I don't really quite understand that question just on the surface, and so I looked into it, and it seems as if this man was actually asking, can anyone now become a prophet, no matter who their father is? This seems to be suggesting here that they've really kind of lowered the standard of what it takes to be a prophet. I mean, they'll just let anybody prophesy these days. 
you know, Saul's father, well, he was just a Benjamite farmer, and now who's this Saul? Is he one of these prophets? Well, without a doubt, Saul's prophetic expression had become all the talk of the town. As a matter of fact, there at the end of verse 12, we see how everyone began to ask, is Saul also among the prophets? Or to put it in today's terminology, Saul's friends were tweeting, and they were updating their Facebook status, you know, and they're, they're, they've got the breaking news. They've got the news story here that Saul's become religious. I can only imagine that Saul was feeling a little uneasy knowing that he had become the center of attention. Well, rather than taking the time to share his experience with his peer group, rather than taking the time to stop and talk to his former friends and say, hey, here's the deal. Here's what's going on in my life. No, he didn't do that. Saul decided to make a hasty escape. With this in mind, look with me there again at verse 13, because there we learn that when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. He didn't stop to talk. No, he was out of there. As soon as he could go, Saul left the city, and you know he wanted to just avoid the scrutiny of his friends, and he made a beeline for that one place that he knew that his spiritual calling would be accepted. He went to the high place where people would go to worship the Lord. I'm guessing that this hasty decision to head up to the high place was due to the fact that this prophetic expression, which happened in front of his friends, had left him a little embarrassed. It was probably much easier to just leave than to stick around and explain this new spiritual calling to his peer group. In similar fashion, it's easy for every new believer, for every Christian, to find themselves struggling with the embarrassment that occurs whenever our friends begin to find out about our newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe we grew up living one way, doing one thing, and we used to be the party animal, or we used to be the sports fanatic, or whatever it was, and then we found Christ, or I should say Christ found us. And now we're worshiping Jesus, and we can find ourselves uncomfortable around those who are unbelievers. And without a doubt, those who are unbelievers are very uncomfortable with those who are walking with Jesus Christ. We know that when they find out about our conversion, we're going to become the talk of the town, at least amongst our peers. We know that as soon as they find out about our newfound faith, that some are going to even make fun of us simply because we're choosing to live for the Lord. And as a result, many Christians choose to just run away. We run to the high place like Saul did. Or in other words, many of us will start hiding our faith from our unbelieving friends. We'll, we'll still just, just try to fit in with them and act like, eh, yeah, the Christian thing, I'm doing it on Sunday, but no big deal on Monday. We want to avoid the embarrassment that would occur if we simply try to explain our conversion to them because we know that they won't understand. As a result, there are many believers who allow pure-based embarrassment to keep them from expressing their faith in God. Well, that being the case, it's easy for us to see how Saul may have been struggling with the embarrassment that came from his peer groups. But not only that, he was also struggling with the embarrassment that came from his family members. With this in mind, let's look back at our text. I want to begin there at verse 13. There we read that when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servants, where did you go? So he said to look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, tell me, please, what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the, uh, that the donkeys had been found, but about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. Here in these verses, we find Saul, he's running into his uncle as he was heading up to the high place. I'm guessing that his uncle had heard about Saul in the city below. He might have even been there watching Samuel, or watching Saul, I should say, speak those words of, of prophecy. But after finding out about what was going on, he probably decided to follow his nephew up the hill, and he wanted to find out, hey, what's going on, Saul? And there in verse 14, Saul's uncle asked him, where did you go? Now the chances are his uncle knew. His uncle had seen Saul prophesy. But Saul, you know, he's being asked this indirect question, where would you go? And so Saul decided to avoid the indirect question, hey, what's going on with this whole prophecy thing? And he decided to just answer the, the direct question by, by simply saying, hey, look, you know, we went to look for the donkeys. That's all we were doing. We went to look for the donkeys, and they weren't anywhere to be found, so we went and talked to Samuel. Well, this really wasn't the answer that 
Saul's uncle was looking for. And so Saul asked him again, tell me, please, what Samuel said to you? Now he's getting down to the point. He's saying, hey, what, what happened? You, you left to, to look for the livestock, and you were just you know, the farm kid from, from the other side of town, but, but now you've come back and you're hanging out with the prophets and you're prophesying. What's going on? Tell me what Samuel said to you. Now Saul could have told his uncle all about the way that Samuel anointed him to become the future king of Israel, and he could have talked about, about the way that the Holy Spirit came upon him and gave him a new heart, empowered him and given him the gift of prophecy, but he didn't talk about any of that. And rather than focusing on the obvious elephant in the room, Saul simply told his uncle that Samuel told them plainly that the donkeys had been found. Now that's a huge omission of information there. Saul said nothing about his spiritual experience. Saul said nothing about his kingly calling. And as we consider this huge omission of information, it's pretty obvious to me that Saul was struggling with familial embarrassment as his uncle sought to understand this buzz about town and how he was prophesying with the prophets. And it's in similar fashion that there are many new believers who find themselves struggling to explain the changes in their life to those family members who are now asking about their newfound faith. We have an experience with Christ and, and our family members start recognizing that things are changing in our, in our lives and they come and they, they say, hey, what's going on with you? But maybe we're just too embarrassed to tell them. And, and like Saul, who seemed to be a bit embarrassed about this spiritual experience that he's had, Christians can also struggle with the embarrassment of explaining these events surrounding their conversion simply because we assume that they just won't understand. You know, our family members, they've seen us go through all of the life changes. They saw us get into this sport, and they saw us get interested in, in this other thing, and, and, you know, we went to college, and then we changed our, our, our career path five different times, you know. We, 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 we've made so many changes in our life so many times that they're just going to think it's just one more little, little venture that we're taking. Maybe our embarrassment stems from the fact that our family embraces a whole other belief system. Maybe they are not Christians. Maybe they, they believe in something else. And so to come home and say, hey, I've become a Christian, well, that's going to be a difficult conversation. I'd be too embarrassed to even address it. Maybe we spent years as an outspoken atheist, and, and we're quick to make fun of Christians for many, many years, and now we're just embarrassed to go back and say, I was wrong. It's possible that we claimed to be a Christian all along, but now that we've truly had an ex a conversion experience, we're too embarrassed to tell them that, you know, I was really living a lie for many years. I didn't get saved at youth camp. I didn't get saved, you know, years ago when I said I did. I just got saved. It's too embarrassing to deal with that. Whatever the situation is, many Christians like Saul, we struggle to discuss our faith with our family members, and the reason why is because we're just too embarrassed. Well, listen, not only was Saul struggling with the embarrassment that came from his peer groups, and not only was he struggling with the embarrassment that came from his family members, but he was also struggling with the embarrassment that came from just complete strangers. With this in mind, look with me again at our text. I want to begin reading at verse 17. Because there we read that Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, and from the hand of all kingdoms, and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your adversities and all your tribulations. And you have said to him, No, set us a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near the tribe, uh, had, uh, excuse me, all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Here in these verses, we find the prophet Samuel gathering all of the people to that city of Mitzvah. And I'll remind you that Mitzvah was to Israel what Austin is to Texas because of its centralized location. Mitzvah was right there in the middle of Israel, and so coming to that centralized location was easy for every tribe. And as all these people were gathered together there in Mitzvah, uh, they came to hear the word of the Lord through the prophet Samuel. Samuel began by reminding them 
that the Lord was only providing them with a king because this is what they were asking for. It was really just kind of a rejection of God. And they wanted this human king to rule over them, and so God was like, okay, it's within my permissive will, certainly not my perfect will, but since you asked, I'll give them to you. And after reminding them that this king was their idea, Samuel went on to reveal the identity of their king. And rather than simply announcing Saul as their king, I think that Samuel seemed to have a flair for the dramatic. He decided to reveal Israel's king through this process of elimination. And he lined up all 12 tribes. And he said, oh, 11 you? No, but Benjamin. As a matter of fact, look there at verse 20 where we learn that Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And so he eliminated 11 of the tribes, and it was the tribe of Benjamin that this king would come from. And then Samuel narrowed it down even further to one family within the tribe of Benjamin. Look there at verse 21, where we learn that Samuel had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come nearby their families, and the family of Matri was chosen. So once again, Samuel eliminated all the majority of the Israelites there by revealing that that their king would come from a specific family within the tribe of Benjamin. And that's when Samuel revealed the name of their king. Look there at the second half of verse 21, because Samuel revealed there that it was was Saul, the son of Kish, who was chosen. Unfortunately, after he was named, they, they sought him, but he couldn't be found. In other words, the king was hiding. And I believe it was because he was too embarrassed to show up at his own crowning. As a matter of fact, look with me there at verse 22, where we learn that they inquired of the Lord further. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him? They're like, How can we not? He's taller than everyone else. Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? But there is no one like him among the, all the people. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Well, here in these verses, we find Saul hiding in the equipment. Whereas the translators of the New Living Translation put it, Saul was hiding among the baggage. Imagine for a moment all of these Israelites from every city in Israel arriving there at Mitzvah. And if you've ever taken trips with your family, I mean, you know how much luggage you're carrying with you. Without question, each tribe probably had a caravan of donkeys and carts and all of the gear and equipment and baggage that they needed for this journey. So I imagine that each tribe had a pretty large stockpile of stuff. Each tribe had a pretty large pile of baggage with them. And as Samuel called for Saul so that he might anoint him the king of Israel, Saul was so embarrassed that he was over there hiding himself among all the baggage from the nation of Benjamin. Now for a moment, just imagine. Place yourself in Saul's shoes. Imagine being some nobody kid from some small town in Israel. You're you're taller than everyone else, and so chances are you were made fun of as you were growing up. And from out of nowhere, you went to go find some lost livestock, and you met a a prophet who's ready to stand you up in front of the entire nation filled with people you've never met before and declare you to be the sovereign ruler over all these people. Now, if you're thinking, yeah, that'd be awesome, you don't get it. This is scary stuff. Because not only will you need to give an acceptance speech in front of all these people, But then as you begin to lead them, you'll be scrutinized by most and rejected by many, just like Moses was as he tried to lead the people. Now, in light of this enormous amount of pressure, is it any wonder that Saul decided to hide himself among the baggage? Is it any wonder that he wanted to avoid risking the embarrassment of being the first king to fail? And while the scale of our embarrassment is definitely much smaller than Saul's, there are many Christians here today who are hiding among their own baggage. We're hiding among our own baggage because we're too embarrassed to 
express our faith in front of complete strangers. We're unwilling to go do street evangelism. We're unwilling to share our, our faith with someone we've never met before because we've got too much baggage and we're too embarrassed. Now, in order to further explain what I mean by this, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. You see, it's in Matthew 26 that we find the apostle Peter. He's struggling with his own embarrassments. You see, Peter, consider for a moment, he had his own fishing business. He's a self-made man. He's, he's a burly guy. But he decided to put down his own company and, and walk away from it and follow this guy Jesus for three years. And the reason why he did this is because he truly believed that Jesus was in fact the promised Messiah, the one found in the Old Testament scriptures. He believed that Jesus was the Christ. But then came the night that he watched the Lord being placed under arrest. And I imagine at that moment in time, he began to experience a crisis of faith. Wait a minute. I gave up my business. I've been following this guy around for three years. I'm waiting for him to chase the Romans out of Israel and take the throne of David, and now he's under arrest? I'm sure he had a crisis of faith as he watched the man that he had followed for three years being led away in chains. I'm guessing that Peter even began to struggle with the embarrassing feelings that maybe I've been following a phony this whole time. With this in mind, look with me there at Matthew 26, towards the end of the chapter there, beginning at verse 69. There Matthew tells us that Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone, <clears throat> excuse me, when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. A little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept, wept bitterly. Here in these verses, we find Peter denying Jesus three times just as the Lord told him he would. And his rejection of Jesus occurs simply because some complete strangers asked him if he knew Jesus. People he had never met before, just complete random strangers, and they're like, hey, don't you know Jesus? Weren't you hanging with Jesus? And he was quick to respond, no way, Jose. I don't know that guy. While it's possible that he was just trying to avoid arrest, that's what many believe. I'm guessing that he was just too embarrassed to admit that he had been following a man who claimed to be the Messiah and yet only ended up under arrest and on trial for blasphemy. I think that he was having a crisis of faith. I think he was struggling with this whole concept of Jesus being under arrest and what does this mean? Is this really the Messiah? And we should notice how Peter's rejection got progressively worse. For example, look again there at verse 69 because here some little servant girl comes up and asks him, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. And there in verse 70, Peter denied it, saying, I don't know what you're saying. So it's not a direct rejection of Jesus at this point in time. He's just saying, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. Then in verse 71, another little girl comes up to him, saying to those who were there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And there in verse 72, Matthew tells us that Peter again denied with an oath this time, I do not know the man. Or in other words, it's gone from, I don't know what you're talking about, to I don't know Jesus. He even swore with an oath. He's saying, hey, I'll swear on a stack of Bibles that I don't know Jesus. Finally, there at verse 73, we read that those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are also one of them, and is what they said, your speech betrays you. He spoke like a Galilean probably. And with that, Peter changed his speech. He began to curse. He began to swear. Thankfully, Matthew left all that out, but he just put there, I do not know the man. But with
with cursing and swearing. He's saying, I don't know, bleep, bleep, bleep that man. And from this, we see how Peter's embarrassment caused him to start cussing like a sailor so that he could disguise who he really was. In front of these complete strangers. Now, we shouldn't fail to notice that Peter's embarrassment seemed to stem from the scrutiny of, of, of two little girls and a couple of guys. Therefore, as we consider Peter's struggle with embarrassment, we too should take a moment to consider our own struggles with the embarrassment that can come from complete strangers. And with this in mind, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 9, and we'll continue to consider our own struggles with the embarrassment that we might experience as we talk about spiritual things in front of complete strangers. And as you're turning to Luke 9, we should take a moment to realize that there is something deep inside of our psyche which drives us to desire the acceptance of others and, yes, even the acceptance of complete strangers. This desire for the acceptance of complete strangers has led many believers to hide in their own baggage like Saul hid. And this desire for acceptance has caused some Christians to start acting like the unbelievers around them in order to avoid being exposed as a follower of Jesus, much like Peter on the night of Jesus' arrest. And if this is something that you struggle with, then please consider the words of Jesus found here in Luke chapter 9. I want to begin reading at verse 18, because there Luke tells us that it happened as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Here in these verses we find Jesus talking with his disciples about his true identity. And while most of the people during this period of time seemed to be confused about who Jesus was, Peter was quick to declare that Jesus was in fact the Christ of God, or in other words, the promised Messiah. And after Peter made this good confession of faith, Jesus insisted that they shouldn't share this with anyone until after his death, burial, and resurrection. But now that Jesus has risen from the grave... He's called every Christian. He's commissioned each one of us to go out and share this truth with every person the Lord brings across our path. And with that being the case, we must remember always that Jesus declared that whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. If you're too embarrassed to talk about Jesus today, Jesus seems to be suggesting here that he's going to be too embarrassed to call your name when he comes. Is that too harsh? This is what Jesus said. And from this, we must understand that while every believer will struggle with the embarrassment of spiritual things on some level, it's also important for us to overcome this embarrassment, which is associated with our faith in Christ, so that we might not be ashamed of the Lord. Now, in order to consider how we can overcome this embarrassment, if you would, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as you turn to 2 Corinthians 5, I want to take a moment to consider the right motivation for overcoming our embarrassment, because I personally don't believe that the fear of punishment is the best motivator. I'm not trying to get you to go out and share your faith because you're afraid that Jesus is going to be ashamed of you one day. I don't think that the fear of punishment is going to help us to overcome the fear of embarrassment. It's like fighting fire with fire. As a matter of fact, I believe that the believer who begins to share their faith with others out of a fear or out of fearful obligation, they'll only end up preaching Christ but for the wrong reasons and not from a loving conviction. 
Therefore, I believe that we should allow the love of Christ to help us to overcome our embarrassments. And with this in mind, if you would look with me there at uh, 2 Corinthians 5, I want to begin reading at verse 13, because there Paul declares, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. And note this, for the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Here in these verses, Paul was telling the Christians in Corinth that if he appeared to be beside himself, or in other words, if he appeared to be crazy, it was for God. And he's saying, hey, look, I don't really care if people think I'm crazy. I, you know, I'm over this whole embarrassment thing. And if people think that I'm insane for preaching the grace of Jesus Christ, then let them think I'm crazy. I do it for God. But he's no longer embarrassed about going out and preaching this gospel message. Now understand that Paul wasn't some superhero. He's just some guy just like us. He's just a human. He had embarrassments just like we do. And so how is it that he was able to overcome his embarrassment? And in order to answer this question, we should notice again there at verse 14 where Paul declares, for the love of Christ compels us. In other words, Paul was telling us that he overcame his embarrassment because the love of Jesus Christ persuaded him to value the souls of men more than the acceptance of men. We need to come to that place in our lives where we value the soul of the man more than their approval. He was helping us to see here how the love of Christ had prompted him to put aside his own personal desire for approval and instead run the risk of embarrassment and run the risk of rejection so that some might believe on Jesus and be saved. And as we consider the way that the love of Christ compelled Paul to overcome his own struggle with embarrassment, we should notice again there in verse 16 where Paul declares, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. The translators of the New Living Translation put it like this, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. From this we see that Paul was no longer looking at people as those that he needed acceptance from. He's no longer regarding people according to the flesh. He's no longer looking at people and seeing people around him as a means to his end for feeling accepted and comfortable. Instead, he was looking at people through the lens of the Lord's love. And he was looking at people as targets to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the same way, we too can easily overcome our own embarrassments the embarrassments that arise when we share our faith. Now, in order to understand how this is possible, if you would, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. And as you're turning to Romans 1, I want to point out that while there might be many sources of our own embarrassments, there really is only one solution. So regardless of whether you're struggling with the embarrassments that that arise with the pressure that comes from our peer groups or, or the awkwardness that comes from family members or the insecurities that we might feel in front of complete strangers... There's one solution which can help us to overcome every kind of embarrassment that we might experience whenever we're given the opportunity to share our testimony about our faith in Jesus Christ. And I believe that solution is found here in Romans chapter 1. Look with me there at verse 13, because there Paul declares, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as in, is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Here in these verses we find Paul putting the love of God into action. Back to the Corinthians he was saying, the love of Christ compels me. How does it compel him? It compels him to go and preach the gospel to every person, whether they're wise or unwise, whether they were a Greek or a, or a full-blown barbarian. It didn't matter to Paul. 
The love of Christ compelled him to move forward and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. I'm here to tell you that the Lord has given every single believer the same power to lead others into the salvation of God's grace through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, with all of this in mind, imagine for a moment Just imagine that you're standing there on the banks of a river. And you're all dressed up. You're headed for a semi-formal event there on the waterfront. And as you're walking to that event, all dressed up, hair done right, looking good, all of a sudden you hear someone screaming out for help. And that screaming is coming from the water. And you scan the river and you see that person out there and they're drowning. They're going to die out there. And at this point in time, you realize, hey, I'm a great swimmer. I could easily just jump in and save this person's life. But then you remember, I'm all dressed up. The water might ruin my appearance. I might show up to this event looking disheveled, soaking wet. Hair would be ruined. Girls, makeup would be ruined. I sure would be embarrassing to show up to that event looking all soaked and, yeah, bummer for that guy. And then you let them drown. Because you'd rather not risk the embarrassment of showing up to that event wet. Now that's ridiculous, isn't it? If you knew how to swim, you'd jump right in and get soaked and it wouldn't be a problem, right? Right? The scenario seems completely ridiculous, and yet how often do we allow our own struggles with embarrassment to lead us into a similar sort of decision, yet on a spiritual level? How many times do we allow someone to just continue on their path straight to hell because we don't want to run the risk of embarrassing ourselves by telling them that we believe in Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ can save them? Isn't that no different than standing on the banks of that river saying, well, I just don't really want to get wet. It's too embarrassing. Let them drown. It's the same heart. Rather than allowing people to drown in their sins, I want to remind you that the Lord has given every believer the power to lead others into the salvation of the Lord. Christian, you have been given the power. It's the gospel message. And you can choose to not use that power and just let everybody go to hell. Or you can choose to use that power and preach the gospel so that some might believe and be saved. That being the case, I want to close by encouraging you to to agree with me. Let's put aside our embarrassments. We don't need the acceptance of others. We don't need to be liked. We don't need the approval of people around us. But rather, we should seek the approval of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we should allow the love of the Lord to compel us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that some might be saved by the grace of God. Amen.